I'm Timothy Terrell. Uh, I teach at a small college in South Carolina. Um, I'm a former Mises Fellow from when I was in graduate school here at Auburn. Uh, this is my favorite week of the year. Um, I enjoy teaching these or giving these lectures because students, you're not going to fall asleep, at least I hope not. Uh, unlike my students that are taking a class because it's required and they have to, you know, they have to go through all the, the motions and uh, but you're here because you want to be, and that's, I, I think that says a lot about the, uh, the health of what we're trying to do here. The, the, the uh, Austrian school is, is thriving. And uh, what I'd like to do today is, is give you uh, some application of some ideas about free markets in medical care, which is something that a lot of people would say, you, you can't apply market principles here. Medical care is different. Well, no, not really. Uh, you know, if you raise the price of something, then the quantity that people want to buy is going to increase, or which way did I say that? If the price goes up, the quantity demanded will go down uh, in medical care as well as, as other things. Um, I've had a long interest in this topic because my father was a physician and um, I was a, he was a hard money guy. He was very interested in Austrian economics. Um, and yet, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I talk to students about some of these things, there's a lot of misconceptions about what, um, what the state of medical care is, about uh, how things function, and I'd like to clear some of that up. I had a student, a conversation with a student uh, a number of months ago who said, I'm still in shock that the U.S. has one of the highest maternal mortality rates a continuously declining life expectancy, and overall increasing issues with access to health care. Most other Western nations are ahead of the U.S. in that respect, despite the U.S. having the highest spending in these sectors. Part of this worst performance is due to the lack of accessible health care, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions that people have. I mean, first of all, life expectancy in the United States has not been continuously declining, rather the opposite. Um, there's, I've talked before in this setting about the uh, so-called, well, the disparities that people think exist between the United States and other countries that are the, really the result largely of factors outside of the realm of medical care. Um, so you got, you've got differences in accident rates, for example, which is not really the fault of the medical, uh, medical sector. Uh, differences in how different countries account for child mortality. Um, I did some work on this some years ago, and a lot of that apparent gap in things like infant mortality or life expectancy disappears once you take those factors into account. So um, we, doubtless, we have a lot of problems with American medical care, uh, but some of the comparisons are very misleading. And I want you to just be aware of that. I'm not going to go into those in detail um, here, uh, but th th if, if you hear that kind of thing and you get these little you know, something on TikTok or whatever about how terrible uh, free market medical care is, um, I, I hope you'll uh, take that with a grain of salt. Um, so I wanted to talk about several pieces of the government's takeover of uh, medical care in the United States, uh, with apologies to those of you in other countries, but I think you'll find some parallels probably in your own in your own countries. Number one is uh, something that Patrick Newman talked about very well um, yesterday, and that is medical licensure. So I'll just review here since he covered a lot of this in, in, in detail yesterday. But we know that um, medical licensure has been around for a long time. This is a, a picture of a, an 1824 medical license from Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. Um, we had a lot of competition in medical care. You, not everybody had to fall lockstep into the Johns Hopkins model that um, Dr. Newman talked about yesterday. Uh, so we had a lot of um, uh, experimentation. Uh, some things failed and failed miserably. Other things succeeded. Um, and so when you've got that kind of uh, dynamic uh, environment in medical care, you can get some innovation out of that, and that's exactly what happened. Um, Medical licensure took a big step forward with the Flexner Report, which I'll mention again in a minute. Um, but in the late 1800s, the United States had a, a lot of access to professional medical uh, pra 
practitioners, uh, the highest number of physicians per capita in the world. Now, some of those were probably not very good physicians. Others were excellent. Um, but as you saw yesterday in Dr. Newman's talk, this, this was not to the liking of doctors who wanted to pull up the drawbridge, not allow any more doctors in, or at least re greatly restrict the number of new doctors in order to drive up their own pay. And so in 1904, the AMA, the America, American Medical Association, began to try to reduce the number of medical students in the, with, with the argument that this is going to make doctors better and people are going to have better medical care. Of course, there is, as we know, a trade-off. You can have a, a lot of doctors uh, or you can keep out a lot of doctors and end up with um, uh, maybe improved quality, but then what good is high quality if you can't get in to see your doctor? Um, so in 1910, um, and again, uh, the, the, um, a lot of this content was discussed yesterday, but the, the Flexner report came out uh, with the backing of the Carnegie Foundation on medical education. The upshot of this was that they closed a lot of medical schools, the vast majority of them. In fact, um, my numbers said 155 down to 31. Um, a lot of the medical education became very homogenous, uh, you're not allowed to do things outside of the accepted um, methods. Uh, any new medical school had to be approved by the state government. Uh, if you wanted to practice medicine, you had to basically pass through the, the uh, AMA's own uh, accepted um, medical education processes. The result of this, too, was that um, prices of medical care went up. Uh, doctors were paid better. Uh, but there were a whole lot fewer doctors. Uh, the schools of alternative medicine um, were almost all closed with a handful of exceptions. And this, of course, means that that experimentation with different kinds of medical uh, uh, practice was uh, greatly diminished. Um, the changes also resulted in fewer women, fewer African Americans in medical education. Um, uh, Michael Lacod observed that only two out of the seven African-American medical schools and only one women's medical college survived those reforms in the early uh, 1900s. So I, I just wanted to review those uh, ideas because of that. That is kind of underlying a lot of the restrictions. Even today, uh, if you want um, certain kinds of medical procedures, um, you're, you have to go to a doctor, an MD for some of these, a licensed medical professional, even if someone else is capable of doing it, uh, maybe a, a nurse practitioner or some other kind of uh, practitioner of medicine, it's not, it's not going to be allowed for those other practitioners to carry out that procedure, even if they're very competent at it. The second part I wanted to mention is the Food and Drug Administration. Um, now, I, I've hammered on the FDA for a number of years when I give this talk. I, I really can't stand the FDA. Um, <laughs> but if I talk to students about this, they, they'll say, well, who, who would make sure our drugs are safe? I mean, you don't want people uh, um, consuming rat poison under the impression that this is somehow going to make their, their headache go away. Um, and I also get this, well, don't you remember um, these, these quack medications that people would take 120 years ago and so forth. And, and I'm like, well, yeah, but, I mean, that was 120 years ago. Uh, you know, I don't expect that if it hadn't been for the Department of Transportation or something, that we'd still be driving around in Model Ts either. You know, we, we learn and science does progress. And uh, a lot of these, um, you know, I, I don't think we'd go back to some uh, kind of crazy um, uh, quack medication if it were not for the FDA. Uh, protecting us from our, our, ourselves. Uh, the FDA started in 1906. It was part of the Pure Food and Drug Act, which was pushed by Theodore Roosevelt, one of those presidents that I at one point thought very highly of, but then learned uh, a little more about. And um, the FDA gained power over the years, as many federal bureaucracies do. In 1938, there was the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and then in 1951, some amendments that established a prescription-only category. Uh, 1962, some more amendments, which actually this was a pretty significant change because it gave the FDA the power not only to 
uh, check out the safety of a drug and approve it on that basis, but also the efficacy. So then they're trying to decide whether it works. And of course, I, you know, again, people have misconceptions about this kind of thing. They think, okay, well, drugs are either safe or not safe. They either work or they don't work. And they forget that there are massive trade-offs with, uh, with, with, for example, safety. No drug is 100% safe. The only way to be completely safe from side effects of a drug, adverse side, of effect, uh, side effects of a drug, is to not take it. Right? That, that's the only way to be 100% safe. So anytime you take a drug of any kind, you are accepting some risk. The FDA has inserted itself into this by saying, well, we know what those trade-offs ought to be. We know how, how safe uh, how much safety you have to um, you have to have, and you're not allowed to go below the boundary that we have established for this. Same thing with efficacy. Well, you know, maybe maybe it's not efficacious. Maybe I, maybe I think that um, it's worth a try. Uh, maybe I'm very desperate to be uh, cured or treated uh, for for my condition, and I, I'd really like to uh, to to give an experimental drug a, a shot. Um, there have been some promising movements in recent years to allow more of that kind of thing, but the FDA um, cannot know every individual's willingness to trade off safety versus efficacy, how much risk am I willing to take in order to get a possibly effective treatment. They, they can't know that at all. In 1984, there was the extend, extension of the length of patents on drugs, another barrier to entry in, um, in medical care. Um, and so all of these kinds of uh, uh, powers that the FDA has attained over the decades have led to several problems, one of which is what we call drug lag. Uh, one famous example of this, uh, which I share with my students every year, is the uh, septra, the antibiotic septra, which, according to uh, George Hitchings, cost 80,000 lot not the antibiotic, but the, the delay in getting this antibiotic to the market cost 80,000 lives just in the United States. People that would have been saved if they had had access to this antibiotic, but uh, because the FDA was making sure that we were safe, 80,000 people died uh, by, by our estimate. Uh, beta blockers, probably about 250,000 lives lost in the United States. Of course, we don't know exactly who those individuals are. Um, it's hard to identify, but we know about how effective beta blockers are, and uh, that lag in FDA approval cost a lot of lives. Uh, drug analyst um, Dale Geiringer uh, said that the benefits of FDA regulation relative to similar regulation in other countries could reasonably be put at some 5,000 casualties per decade or 10,000 per decade. Um, that, that's the, you're avoiding those deaths or casualties rather. Um, in comparison, the cost of FDA delay can be estimated at anywhere from 21,000 to 120,000 lives per decade. So um, the FDA is going to point at uh, cases like thalidomide, uh, you know, the, a, a drug that was administered for morning sickness. It had been approved in Europe. It had not yet been fully approved here, and it ended up causing um, tragic birth defects. And so the FDA says, you know, see, because we were careful, you didn't get those birth defects here in the United States like we, we saw in other countries. Uh, that, that's looking at only one side of, of what's going on. Um, Drug suppression. I mean, the costs of the FDA include not just the delayed access, but also the fact that FDA approval costs so much that um, drug developers say, well, basically, we're just not willing to um, develop a new drug. I, I know of one case in which there was a, a, a nutritional supplement for premature babies that was um, being used in Europe. The company that made it was not even trying to get FDA approval here in the United States because of the cost of jumping through FDA hoops, and so they just didn't, didn't bother. According to Mary Ruart, at least half of pharmaceutical innovations get shelved because the cost to take the drug through the regulatory testing process makes those drugs uneconomic for drug developers to pursue. 
and uh, she found that the years of life lost due to FDA clinical demands is somewhere in the millions. So this is not a, an agency that is simply making us more safe than perhaps we might choose for ourselves. It is actually harming us uh, by keeping helpful new drugs off the market, uh, at least for longer than they otherwise would be available. Uh, information suppression is part of this. Uh, in the early 1980s, there were several reports in medical journals that indicated that folic acid, if you take it early in pregnancy, could prevent a number of birth defects. Uh, but if manufacturers of folic acid wanted to advertise those benefits, they would have to go through a very expensive process um, by the FDA, uh, mandated by the FDA. Had they been permitted to advertise, maybe we would have seen a lot fewer um, birth defects. Instead, the estimates are about 10,000 American babies were born with deformities because uh, drug manufacturers were not allowed to advertise that uh, benefit. Same, same kind of um, problem may exist with um, low-dose aspirin. I mean, the, the, if you wanted to uh, advertise, at least years ago, if you wanted to advertise that low-dose aspirin would be effective in helping prevent heart attacks, um, sorry, you've got to go through this whole process before you can put that on your label and, and advertise that, that possible benefit. So as Tom DiLorenzo has pointed out, new drugs don't do consumers any good if they don't know about them, and advertising restrictions imposed by the FDA prop up the profits of incumbent drug makers, and uh, this is at the expense of newcomers in the industry. So this, this is, you know, the, the FDA, is it really working for the benefit of patients or is it working for the benefit of drug manufacturers that want to keep competition out? If you can create this very high barrier to entry uh, through the FDA, um, you might be able to, yeah, as an individual pharmaceutical company, you've got you've to meet those requirements and cross that hurdle, but you also keep out upstart competitors uh, as well. Um, during the uh, COVID-19 years, uh, we saw the FDA standing in the way of developing new co uh, coronavirus tests. Uh, we had a German test available in uh, January of 2020. The FDA said we're not going to use it. Um, private labs are also prevented from developing tests. And then, if that weren't enough, the CDC contributed to a shortage of tests with this policy of distributing tests without regard to the size of local populations. Uh, so in early March, facilities in the United States, March of 2020, the facilities in the United States had administered about 3,100 tests, and in South Korea, a much smaller country than the United States, um, their epidemic started the same day ours did, insofar as you can tell what day it started, um, and they had administered 180,000. Uh, so uh, you, we can quibble about, you know, how effective these tests were and what, what were they actually capturing, and, and we can have that conversation later, I suppose. But if you're just interested in did people get the tests that they were interested in taking or that their employers were interested in them taking, uh, we were a lot less effective at it than we could have been. Uh, At-home testing was, was, uh, uh, was shut down by the FDA, uh, forcing people into channels that may have aggravated any kind of infectivity that we were um, trying to avoid. Uh, so, you know, we had fewer tests. They were you know, administered in a way that didn't make any sense. And then, too, I mean, I, I don't know if you remember uh, the, the fact that distilleries, because they weren't um, able to manufacture and sell as much of their, of their normal product uh, in, in 2020, 2021, they started making um, hand sanitizer. Uh, they, everybody wanted hand sanitizer all, all of a sudden. And hand sanitizer makers couldn't keep up. And so the distillery said, well, you know, this is basically uh, some kind of alcohol-type product. We can make this. And so um, distillers started making hand sanitizer. I seem to remember it kind of smelled funny, but, hey, it was hand sanitizer. And everybody thought that they needed this stuff. So there was a kind of a run on that, on that market. Well, the FDA um, uh, had 
that in mind that they needed to check this hand sanitizer to make sure that it didn't have certain impurities in it. So they took their samples and uh, the distillery, they went away and the distilleries thought, okay, well, I guess we passed whatever the FDA's requirements were. Well, a year and a half later, the FDA came back around and said, well, you know, you had uh, too much of this particular uh, chemical in your hand sanitizer. Now, who knows what happens to samples after they sit on a shelf for a year and a half, but uh, the, the samples were uh, um, uh, cited by the FDA as, as being substandard as far as this, this, uh, this contaminant, as they thought of it. And so they started to fine the distilleries, uh, you know, $14,000 fines for making hand sanitizer that contained a little bit too much of some chemical the FDA was worried about. Uh, now, that, that faced some objections and in some cases those fees were waived but the distillers were just regretting ever having tried to step into that gap because of the FDA's um, efforts at, at trying to um, impose more regulation on them. And one distiller said, um, at, at a point in time I was so glad of sanitizer because it helped their business to stay afloat and right now I wish we had never done it. He had taken out a $45,000 loan to produce hand sa uh, sanitizer at a very marginal profit, and he said, I will not put myself on this same chopping block again. So um, rather than encouraging innovation and the production of things that people want in an emergency, the FDA was standing in the, in the way of that. I, I, I can't leave this alone without, uh, or leave this section, section without talking about patents. Um, we know that this idea that we, we have to create this intellectual property is, is uh, very common, uh, even among people who are kind of market-oriented, and yet uh, it seems to be completely unnecessary and, in fact, harmful. Again, it's another barrier to entry, in, and innovation that otherwise would occur is, um, is uh, stifled. Uh, there's all kinds of patent abuse, even, even if you... Uh, accepted some modest kind of patent uh, regulation, which I, I don't. But if you did, uh, why why would you why would you want to open yourself up to this kind of this kind of this kind of abuse by uh, manufacturers that that extend their patents um, and keep out their competition with the with the aid and uh, support of the government? Um, it does not appear, and I encourage you to read this article by. Um, Nathan Nicolaisen from uh, Mises Daily some years ago, it, it doesn't appear that this is even helping, helping to, to encourage innovation. Uh, one CDC survey, uh, you'll, you'll pardon me citing the CDC here uh, as a reliable source, but uh, they said, uh, quote, of the 10 most important medical discoveries of the 20th century, none of them had anything to do with patents. Um, so, uh, then, uh, you know, we, I still hear about this. I mean, this is years and years ago, but I still hear from students about the EpiPen and oh, how, how terrible it was that the, this, this company raised its prices and this is capitalism run amok and, and we need regulation on prices because if we don't have this regulation on prices of drugs, then companies go and do this. Well, how did, how did this company raise its price without worrying about competition? Well, because it had a patent because the government was keeping the competition out. So, uh, you know, I, I point this out to students and, and like, well, the reason that you, you see this is because they don't have to worry about somebody else making this product, which is not a mystery, it's epinephrine. I mean, it's, it's, it's not some kind of magic formula that only, only a few people know about. This is, this is a, I mean, they had a patent on this injector and the FDA is busy keeping competing injector technology out while the patent is extended by or is acquired by uh, Merck. And, uh, well, yeah, of course, the, the company raised the price because they did not have to worry about new competition. Um, my land, not Merck, sorry. Um, so, you know, I point this out and students are like, oh, well, yeah, I guess, okay. But that's what you get when you, you get, your, you get your, uh, your thoughts about capitalism from a three-second um, TikTok. <laughs> so um, 
part three, I, I wanted to talk some about medical insurance. I, um, I would say that you know we've got a lot of medical insurance that is government run. Uh, most medical insurance in the United States is nominally private. Uh, but why do we have so much medical insurance paying for medical um, conditions? And a lot of this has to do with taxes, basically, income taxes. During World War II, income tax rates were um, higher than they are now. Uh, the highest bracket, I think, was like 97% by the end of World War II. Um, and firms were trying to figure out how to attract workers and allow the workers to have more kind of take-home pay, even with these very high tax rates. And so they figured what they would do is, since medical insurance was not taxable, they would give their employees a benefit of medical insurance. And uh, that um, uh, began to grow and, and, in fact, grew very rapidly in the 1940s. So we had about 10 million Americans who had health insurance of any kind in 1940, we had 80 million who had medical insurance by 1950. So it exploded. Uh, third party payers, whether that's government or private, tend to create moral hazard problems, which means if someone else is paying the bill, you're going to become a much worse shopper. You're not going to care. I've told the example before in previous uh, lectures on this that I went to get, to get an MRI one time. And I didn't even look at the price. I got the form from my insurance company a few weeks later, and they said, oh, well, you know, this was $6,000, and we paid 5700 of it or something. And uh, I, you know, I didn't care. But if, if they had told me it's $6,000 and you're going to have to pay this out of pocket, I would have told my um, medical practitioner, well, can you get by with an X-ray? Um, you know, my back pain is not that bad. Um, and, and because other people are paying, people become a lot less careful about rationing. We can see this here uh, with the, the, the in increase in um, health insurance as opposed to out-of-pocket payments. So in 1960, we have about half and half, about half of your medical costs are being paid out-of-pocket and about half were being paid by insurance of some kind. And uh, several decades later, and we're at about 90-10, 90% being paid by insurance. Now, of course, that means that uh, prices are going to go up, too, because if you've got a whole bunch of people out there that are not really caring about what the price is, prices are going to rise. That's going to be a big part of this. We can see the contrast with cosmetic procedures which are typically not covered by insurance. And if you look at the um, CPI for all items over this time period that we're looking at here, 1998 to 2016, it's a 47% increase. If you look at uh, medical care services as a whole, it's about 100%, and hospital services about 176% or 177%. And look at cosmetic procedures that we've got here on this list. Some went down in price while the CPI was going up. Uh, many others uh, went up, but at a rate that was far below um, medical care services in general. In fact, I don't think any of these beat 100%. The highest number I saw in this was for chin augmentation. So uh, anyway, so I don't know why that one went up by 82.5%, but anyway. Um, High demand for chin augmentation, I guess. Anyway, so um, what we've seen is rising costs because of these, these uh, third-party payers. Um, studies have indicated that this really does matter quite a bit, that, that a fully insured population spends about 40 to 50% more than a population that has a large deductible. Um, and furthermore, your status is not measurably improved by the additional medical care that you are consuming with your uh, insurance. So uh, you, you're, you're spending a lot more, but the marginal benefits of your medical care are um, quite small and decreasing. Uh, the study that I've got cited here on the slide 
says that, yes, technological change has increased health care costs in many cases without significantly improving health out outcomes because medical insurance in its current state discourages individuals from economizing health care decisions. So we're spending a lot more, we're getting less and less additional. Now, I've got two parts that I'm hoping to be able to, to get through here in the next um, five minutes or so, 4A and 4B. So 4A is Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, both of these are old programs, they're older than me, um, 1965, and they were passed in as part of the Great Society programs under Lyndon Johnson. Um, Medicaid is uh, a needs-based program. Medicare is for old age as well as uh, those that suffer with renal disease. Medicare has four parts. I won't go into all of these in the interest of time, but I will say that um, if you dig into the details of Medicare, you find that the it's, it's not a market program. It is a government program, but the more market-oriented part of Medicare has been expanding in recent years, which is interesting. People seem to see the benefits of markets even within this government-operated program. Medicare Advantage has been increasing in its enrollment at the expense of uh, single-payer Medicare. And these are, these are privately this is a privately administered component of Medicare. So it is a government program, but pieces of it are a little more market-ish. Uh, and and that, that has um, that, that's, uh, been noticed, evidently, by, by the population. Uh, Medicaid. Uh, I will say just a couple of things about Medicaid. It, it is a program that has been vastly expanded with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that's the 4B that I'll mention in a minute. Uh, but it's not very clear that it's actually doing anything helpful, um, at, at the margin at least. Um, one study not too long ago found that Medicaid coverage generated no significant improvements in health outcomes in the first two years, even though people were consuming more medical care. This is that uh, famous or infamous, I guess, depending on which side of the aisle you're on, that Oregon study where Oregon administered a lottery uh, in 2008, and they said, okay, we're going to randomly select some people who are going to get expanded Medicaid benefits. About 10,000 more people were enrolled as a part of this, their medical service usage increased. Uh, their health uh, was compared then to those who did not win that uh, lottery. And what they found is no statistically significant impact on physical health measures. You got Medicaid, you, you're not any better because of it as a result of this um, lottery. Now, we did see financial strain for the lottery winners decreasing, and the winners had lower rates of depression, but you probably could have achieved that by buying these people a puppy. <laughs> uh, seriously, you probably could have at far lower cost. I mean, really, uh, you, you probably, would have, probably would have been able to accomplish the same result. Um, so if you really care about people being healthier, um, this expansion didn't seem, now this was all completely lost on advocates of the Affordable Care Act. Most, I call that 4B because it's really just an expansion of Medicaid if you get down to what actually happened as a result of the Affordable Care Act. It's just Medicare got, or Medicaid rather, got uh, more extensive. Um, and so there were a number of restrictions on insurance companies. They had to, you know, they, they, they um, had to ignore pre-existing conditions. Um, everybody was required to obtain health insurance, although the penalty for not getting health insurance was dropped to zero in 2019. So um, a lot of the pieces of the Affordable Care Act were um, uh, fairly dramatically changed. Uh, if you remove the penalty on not getting health insurance, then, then that, that's a pretty significant change. Not all states adopted the Medicaid expansion that came out of, uh, out of the Affordable Care Act. Um, 
a lot of these, as you can see, are, are southern states that, that said, no thanks, we're not going to do this. Medicaid is a program that uh, the, the states uh, share the funding of this with the federal government, unlike Medicare. So um, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things about the, uh, about the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, the, the unintended consequences of this were, were serious and predictable. I mean, we, we could have seen this coming. Um, we saw premiums go up. Uh, premiums went up substantially. Um, if insurance companies were required to cover everyone, then even those that were very expensive to cover, then they, they had to be required to cover certain things. They, ha they couldn't uh, refuse to cover pre-existing conditions. If you do all of that, then insurance is going to be very expensive. Um, you, you can't promise to increase the quality without expecting to see an increase in the price as, as well. So that's where the subsidies came in. And the government was going to heavily subsidize this even more than, uh, more than before. But insurers began to pull out of these um, markets. They, uh, the, they said, well, we, we, we can't afford to provide health insurance under these circumstances. So they, they began to back out. Uh, the high premiums were not buying people low deductibles. In fact, deductibles were very high. In 2019, a benchmark silver plan had a deductible of nearly $4,400. So this is not, this is not what uh, the advocates had expected or, or promised. Additionally, employers began to limit the number of employees who worked 30 hours or more per week in order to qualify for uh, this, this kind, of, um, this kind of, of insurance. So uh, you can talk to a lot of people. Most, most people in their, in their 20s have been in a situation where they are, they're working, they're willing to work more, but they can't work more because their employer won't give them more hours because if their employer gives them more hours, then the employer has to provide health insurance. So uh, did you really make somebody better off if they uh, aren't eligible for employer-provided health insurance uh, because they're working fewer than 30 hours a week, and they had been working maybe 35 or 40 hours a week, so they got their hours cut, and now they're having to go one of, to one of these exchanges and buy insurance with a $4,400 deductible. How is this person better off as a result of this? I mean, it, it, it didn't... Um, didn't make a lot of sense. So employers, the, the threshold was like 50 employees. If you had 50 employees or more that were working more than 30 hours a week, then you had to provide them with, with health insurance. And um, so um, that, that had some unintended effects on the labor market. In 2010, the Congressional Budget Office projected that 24 million Americans would enroll in these insurance exchanges that were set up uh, in 2019. Uh, in 2019, when that when this um, uh, this had been in effect for several years, the actual figure was about nine million. Uh, so it did not have the affected or anticipated uh, result. Uh, didn't seem to have much of an effect on mortality rates. Um, 2014 is when this came into full effect, and it. You know, if you look at mortality rates, it's just kind of sitting there, not doing anything much different from the trend. Um, and yet, you had you had advocates of this program that were saying, you're, "You're, if you oppose the Affordable Care Act, then you you just want grandma to die." I mean, how many times have we heard that in the last ten years? So uh, that's uh, um, that actually did not um, end up being anywhere close to the to the to the uh, result. We, di we didn't really see an improvement in mortality. The pre-existing conditions, um, how much would you uh, charge to put fire insurance on this house? Right? So uh, if you've got um, a pre-existing condition, that's like a guarantee that that insurance company is going to have to pay something for your whatever that condition is. Maybe you've got a chronic condition. Now, um, 
there are ways that markets can handle this. I don't have time to go into all those uh, now, but this is, this is uh, somebody did not think this through very carefully. They thought, well, all we got to do is require the insurance companies to ignore these pre-existing conditions, and then uh, we'll, we'll solve the problem without thinking about the fact that you're dramatically increasing the cost of providing medical insurance to those individuals, and those costs have to be borne by somebody. And if you can't raise premiums, and we did see the premiums were fairly high in some of these exchanges, if you can't raise premiums, then you're going to have to transfer the cost to somebody else. And so even when we had penalties placed on individuals for not getting health insurance, many people who are relatively healthy said, you know, I'll pay the penalty because the insurance is going to be so expensive. I'd rather pay the pay that uh, that that cost than and, and continue to go without insurance than pay for the very high cost of the insurance itself. So um, the healthiest people still drop out of the market. This was the the thing that the penalties were intended to prevent, and they they did no such thing. Um, the last piece of this, uh, and I've only got a couple of minutes, and I put a question mark there by this because we, we haven't actually seen this put into place, but there is still a bill in front of the current Congress to put Medicare for All into law. Now, I don't know what its chances are, um, but Medicare for All is, is kind of doubling down on an already bad idea of state intervention for universal medical insurance. And this guy right here uh, was one of the best known advocates of this kind of thing. It would have first dollar coverage, dental, vision, hearing, all of that would be covered. Your payments to providers would be cut by 40% uh, or more relative to private insurance payments. And all of this was supposed to provide people with um, essentially universal medical insurance. It would still be administered by private firms so you're not really getting that part of things um, eliminated, uh, but it was a, uh, an idea that has uh, huge, huge problems. Rather than admit that the market can handle medical care, we're just going to introduce even more government into, um, into medical care. Um, it would be hugely expensive. Um, some estimates about $33 trillion added. Well, what's a trillion dollars anymore, right? But, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of money, uh, very, very expensive. Um, increases in federal medical, medical care expenses would be around 11% of GDP um, and going up from there. Uh, one uh, estimate was that you'd have to double all currently projected federal and corporate income tax collections in order to even get close, and even that wouldn't be sufficient to fund the added cost of this kind of, of uh, plan. So it was, it was going to be tremendously expensive. Um, insurance companies, as I, as I said, would still be around. And if you tell medical providers, doctors, nurses, and, and the rest, you've got to accept a 40% cut in your, in your pay, how many of those are going to stick around? Uh, and, and what does that mean for access to medical care if you've cut pay and, uh, and expect people to still do the, they're not going to do the same job. Um, they'll retire early or they'll work fewer hours. Or they, you'll have people that won't go into the medical field when they're in college and trying to decide about what they want to do with their lives. Um, and th this kind of thing would be uh, the, the, the death of, of, uh, of market medical care, what, what residual we still have in the United States. Well, um, I wanted to throw this out to you as well. You've seen probably the headlines about Social Security going bankrupt or not having enough money to pay promised benefits by 2034. I think that's the current year uh, for Social Security saying we can't pay more than about 70% or so of promised benefits. Well, health insurance, um, Medicare is running into the same kind of problem. Uh, 2025, is where they say we are going to have costs that exceed our income. Uh, and by 2031, which is not that far off, uh, reserves are going to be depleted. Um, 
And so uh, Medicare is in financial trouble, which has a time horizon even closer than that of Social Security. So I don't think that means that they're just going to throw their hands up and say, well, uh, so much for Medicare, we give up and let the market handle it. Um, I think that's going to end up translating into higher uh, taxes and uh, uh, more rationing and, and all the rest when you've got people that are truly committed to government running medical care in spite of all the evidence that it doesn't work. A few sources here, massive topic. If you're interested in more, um, I'll be happy to talk to anyone afterward. And uh, that's all the time I've got, but thanks for <laughs> listening.